It's great to be part of National Heritage Week, and we are doing this uh, presentation as a, uh, our contribution uh, to Heritage Week. And of course, Grace O'Malley is a, a wonderful part of our Irish heritage. And the uh, project that we're doing is called Finding Grace, because I think um, certainly Anne and her book have done an awful lot to help us find out who this woman was. Um, and what I, we're hoping to do, uh, the, the, the O'Malley DNA Project and the O'Malley Clan Association, is throw even more light on the topic through the use of DNA. Now, um, here is Grace O'Malley herself uh, at St. Patrick's Day Parade in uh, Dublin uh, in 2017. And we all know that she was surrounded by pirates. You can see them there in the background. But did you know she was surrounded by sea urchins as well? So um, still very, very much alive in the popular psyche. And uh, that's one of, the, one of the reasons why she is still so alive is because she is such um, an inspiring presence. And she will continue to inspire uh, new generations of school children uh, uh, as, as time goes on, I've no doubt about that. And uh, I think Anne will probably talk to the fact that uh, she actually hasn't been recorded in the Irish history books for an awfully long time. And it's largely thanks to Anne's wonderful biography of Grace O'Malley that her standing in Irish society has taken on a much greater presence. Now, the Finding Grace project was really to establish the DNA signature of the immediate male forebears of Grace O'Malley. And I say the male forebears because we're using Y DNA for this particular project. And the Y chromosome is only passed from father to son, so women don't actually have it. But we invite everybody uh, into the O'Malley DNA project, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, as long as you have an O'Malley ancestor somewhere in your family tree. Everybody is welcome, the more the merrier. And uh, part of the reason for doing the Finding Grace project is because in eight years' time, it will be 2030, and Grace will be 500 years old, and we want to throw her a surprise birthday party. So uh, everybody uh, is invited, and we want to identify as many of her descendants on the Burke and the Flaherty side, but also as many of her O'Malley relatives as possible, because Grace's mother was an O'Malley, as well as her father being an O'Malley. So the first part of this project is looking at the O'Malley side, uh, but ultimately, in, over the course of the next eight years, we also want to look at the Flaherty side, and we want to look at the Burke side as well. Now, the O'Malley DNA project has been running for quite some time, and it is hosted on a website called Family Tree DNA, and they have over 10,000 DNA projects on their particular website. Now, we also have an associated blog post that I run, and what I do is I will do a much more in-depth analysis of some of the uh, data that is produced. How many O'Malley's do we have in the audience, actually? So we have, okay, quite a few. And how many people have done a DNA test? Quite a few as well. Okay. Um, so many of you will be in the O'Malley DNA project, and you'll also be familiar with the fact that we have an O'Malley genealogy forum on Facebook, which has well over 300 members now at this point in time. And this is a great place where people can really congregate, ask questions, and get answers. So it's a real um, a voluntary effort for everybody to help each other. Now, this is recruitment to the project. You can see it started in uh, 2005, and over the years, recruitment grumbled on, but around about uh, middle of, or the start of 2017, <coughs> we really saw this huge increase in recruitment, and it's been going strong ever since. You can see in the last 12 months, we, we had our best year yet, with 63 new members for the project, 40 the previous 12 months, 39 the 12 months before that, and so on. So the project is going from strength to strength. And of those 270 members, 136 of them have done a Y DNA test. Now, the Y DNA, like I say, passes from father to son, so it's very useful for tracking back along the direct male line. Father, 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 father. And it's very useful for surname research for that reason, because you get your surname from your father, who got his surname from his father, 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 father. So the Y DNA is a useful tracker for surnames. 
And there are two types of Y-DNA uh, test. Uh, you've got the, uh, the STOR markers, which are these first two tests. You can test 37 STOR markers or 111 STOR markers. And then you've got the big Y-700 uh, tests, which, which looks at over 700 STOR markers, but also over 200,000 SNP markers. So you start with 37 markers, and the next step is 200,000 markers. And if I told you to walk up 37 flights of steps, you say, yeah, I can do that. Could you walk up 200,000? That gives you an idea of the order of magnitude of difference between the initial starting test for everybody and the one that really delineates where exactly you sit on the tree of mankind. So those are STOR markers, and then the big Y test uh, assesses SNP markers. And this is the recruitment in terms of the big Y test, and you can see that 50 of the 136 people have done the big Y test, and uh, more and more people are doing it all the time, and you see a nice steady increase in the recruitment rate for the big Y test as well. If you go to the O'Malley results page, and anyone can find them, you just Google FTDNA, Mali, and uh, you get these results page. You can see that these are the individual people's people here, and their kit numbers. This is their surname. This is their most distant known ancestor. And then all of these numbers here, those are their STOR results. And this column here is their SNP results. So the STOR results is just a string of numbers, and the SNP result is the act an actual name each SNP uh, marker is given a particular name, which is a, a combination of letters and numbers. And like I say, the SNP uh, markers are discovered through doing the big Y test. Now, there are various uh, updates on the DNA project. If you want to go onto YouTube, you'll find them. Uh, we had one in 2017, another one in 2019. The 2021 update was a virtual one, and then I've done a, a special bespoke video on the O'Malley's of Limerick uh, because we were able to find them mentioned in a medieval, medieval text called the Black Book of Limerick, and that uh, particular video describes the O'Malley's in that particular medieval text. But coming back to what Peter was saying about the surname distribution maps, where do the O'Malley's come from? We know that the O'Malley's were in Mayo. This is based on the 1901 census, and there's a big blob of O'Malley's in Mayo. There's a smaller blob of O'Malley's around Limerick, and then there's a couple in the major urban areas as well. And this, um, these two hotspots, Mayo and Limerick, suggest that maybe there are two separate origins of the O'Malley surname. It's also consistent with surname dictionaries, like uh, the Reverend Patrick Wolfe's Surname Dictionary in 1923, and he describes two groups of O'Malley's. The first one, a Connacht family, who were chief of the two Ools, now the baronies of Burshul and Mursk. And the second one, one was a Thomond family, who were the chiefs of Tua Limni, a district in the neighbourhood of the city of Limerick. And this, these two separate groups are reflected in the DNA. Because from this description, you would expect to have maybe two distinct genetic signatures associated with the O'Malley surname. In actual fact, we have 17. Now, the two largest of these groups is group 3A. This is 35 members in group 3A. And then group 2A is from Limerick, and that has 10 uh, members in that particular group. And the other groups have maybe only uh, two or three people, maybe four people in them. They're much smaller. And a lot of these groups will just represent uh, people who had a DNA switch in their, uh, in their direct male line. So the O'Malley surname, like most Irish surnames, arose about a thousand years ago. But of course, over the course of that last thousand years, there may have been a DNA switch from time to time over that period because of, for example, illegitimacy, infidelity, uh, adoption within the family. But going back into medieval times, you come across some very fascinating potential causes of these DNA switches. So, for example, under Brehan law, if a, um, 
woman was, if a man was infertile and was not um, uh, producing a pregnancy in his wife, the wife was allowed to go and look for a man to produce the pregnancy for her and then come back to the husband who would then raise that particular child. But of course, that would not be his Y DNA, it would be some other man's Y DNA that was present in that child, and all the descendants thereafter would have this foreign Y DNA in, associated with the O'Malley surname. So that's just one example um, of how, when we go back into medieval times, there were a lot of different reasons for why there might be a DNA switch. And a lot of the time a DNA switch was very innocent. For example, um, a young widow, she's got a, a six-month-old baby and a, a two-year-old baby. She remarries and um, the new husband is called O'Malley, so the children change their surname to O'Malley. But they don't have O'Malley Y DNA, it's the DNA of the previous husband. So this particular um, diagram here just shows how all of the O'Malley's are related to each other, all the O'Malley's within the group. And we have a timeline here on the left-hand side, same timeline on the right-hand side, and it goes back 250,000 years, uh, incorporating the last Ice Age, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the uh, era of the clans, but also the various migrations into Ireland, such as the first settlers, the first farmers, the Celts, um, the time of Christ, uh, introduction of Christianity, the Vikings, the Normans, the Black Death, plantations, Cromwell, and the Great Famine of the 1840s. And you can see that all of the O'Malley's are connected by a common ancestor who lived approximately 47,000 years ago. Now, we don't know his name, <laughs> but it probably was Roger or something like that. Anyway, he wouldn't have had a surname. Um, but the time of surnames would have been about a thousand years ago, and you can see that um, the O'Malley's of Group 3A, which is the one that we're really interested in, because this is probably the, the group that represents the Mayo O'Malley's. These are their various snip markers going up this particular ancestral line. And if we get up to just about here, this snip marker here is M222, and it is associated with Nile of the Nine Hostages. So it's not that the O'Malley's are descended from Nile, they are related to Nile. Um, and Nile, of course, was a semi-mythical figure, which basically means he could have been mythical, or maybe he was real. We don't really know. If you look over at the Limerick O'Malley's, they actually are more closely related to Brian Baru than they would be to Nile of the Nine Hostages. So if you're a Limerick O'Malley, then you're uh, related in, uh, to Brian Baru in some particular way. He might be your 19th cousin 27 times removed. Um, now, this is also a map of the migration pathway of the O'Malley's out of Africa. And this is done rather tongue in cheek because the O'Malley's weren't the only ones that came out of Africa. There were millions of people that followed exactly the same uh, migration route. But um, there are three reprobates here on the right-hand side um, who are very, very enthusiastic about uh, this particular uh, migration pathway. And really this slide just serves to show how DNA in the last 20 years has added to what we know from archeology, span carbon dating, and linguistics. Uh, about the migration of human beings out of Africa. And why do we think Group 3A is likely to represent the descendants of the progenitor of the O'Malley surname? Well, first of all, it's the biggest group in the entire project. Secondly, uh, most of the members, 17 out of the 35, so the, the, the largest portion of, of membership, actually trace their ancestry back to Mayo. It's roughly about a thousand years old. If you look at the age estimates associated with these DNA markers, this particular group is roughly about 1,000 years old, uh, which corresponds roughly with the time of the introduction of surnames. And also the SNP signature, so the SNP associated with this particular group, um, M222, is also consistent with what we're told by the ancient genealogies. And the ancient genealogies, here is a uh, crude family tree 
showing Meili, the progenitor of the O'Malley surname, and how he is related to other people nearby. You see, if you go up his ancestral line, his ancestor was Brian, who was the progenitor of the E. Brian in uh, Connacht. And Brian's brother over here, here was Neil Nagyalach, Nile of the Nile hostages. And this information is taken from various sources like O'Hart's Irish mm -hmm. Pedigree, which is very handily available online. Uh, genealogical Tables of Medieval Irish Royal Dynasties by Bart Yasky, also available uh, online. Uh, the History of Mayo by Hubert T. Knox in 1908, which uh, is largely based on Lower Morn and Anaylock by McFurbish. And also uh, Wikipedia has very, very useful sections on the Irish clans. So Nile of the Nine Hostages would sit up here, and then his brother Brian was the ancestor of Maley, and Maley was the ancestor of the O'Malley's. And all along the way, through the passage of time, various branches gave rise to a variety of different associated surnames. So you can see that uh, Nile of the Nine Hostages' uh, descendants are associated with all of these surnames here. And the Maley branch is associated with Ogormila, Og and I'm not sure what the anglicization of that would be. Um, it's also associated with O'Coleman and maybe O'Fergus and Rooney. So what we should be seeing in time is a genetic association between the Group 3A O'Malley's and these other surnames. We're not seeing that at the moment, possibly because some of these surnames were fairly rare to begin with and have gone extinct in the meantime and possibly because if there are people with those surnames still surviving today, they haven't actually done a Y-DNA test as yet, and they're not in the database. So that is something to look out for in, in the future, um, and a genetic connection with the surnames that the O'Malley's are supposed to be associated with on the basis of the ancient genealogies. So the big question is now, does Grace O'Malley belong to Group 3A? And do her male forebears have the same kind of genetic signature that we're seeing for those members that are currently in Group 3A? And most of the members in Group 3A, their um, Irish family trees stop around about the 1800 time point because the records run out and there isn't anything um, beyond that that will give you a clue as to your ancestors. How many people stop about 1800 in their family tree? So it's probably, it's probably most people will find that, yeah, come 1800, you can't go any further. But I looked at several of these previous sources to see if they actually included Grace O'Malley. O'Hart does not, Knox does not, McFurbish does not. Um, the Beetham pedigree from 1832, which is lodged with the genealogical office, gives a line of descent that goes down to Grace O'Malley via these ancestors here. But the MacLyset uh, pedigree, which is also lodged in the genealogical office from 1946, gives a completely different line of descent for Grace O'Malley. They all agree, they both agree that Dermot was her great great grandfather, and Anne, in your book, you go back as far as Owen, her great grandfather. And you'll be talking a little bit about those mm -hmm. people in, in, in a moment. So, this is just to make the point that. You cannot always trust what is written in these ancient genealogies, and you have to approach it with a degree of um, caution and look for uh, confirmation elsewhere. But there does seem to be general agreement down as far as Maley here, and also as far as Murrah down here. But then there are two differing lines of ascent, of descent rather, to Grace's great great grandfather, and uh, but. Whatever the correct one is, what we can say that, uh, that, that they all agree that Grace descends from Maley, who is the progenitor of the Mayo O'Malley's. The next question is, can we identify a specific DNA marker for Grace's great-great-grandfather? And that really is the whole um, basis of the Finding Grace project. So the steps in the process were, first of all, to identify extensive lineages from a variety of different sources um, associated with Grace's great-great-grandfather Dermot. And that meant looking at the 
validated, the so-called validated pedigrees from the genealogical office, Beetham in 1832, McLeiset in 1946, looking at Burke's landed gentry, which typically has no references and no sources, so you can't double check them, and also private collections. Um, and we found a variety of different um, pedigrees from the likes of uh, the Blackwell family and from other people, um, uh, and also from the National Library of Ireland, where some of these pedigrees had been uh, deposited. And the data, we entered them into our O'Malley clan family tree on ancestry. And then we used that to trace living descendants on the direct male line, starting with Dermot, who was born roughly about 1400 AD, uh, Grace's great-great-grandfather. Uh, but it involved a huge amount of genealogical research and also outreach work uh, to local people in the Mayo area. And that was done largely by Brendan O'Malley, Emer Gunter, and Tom O'Malley. So a big thank you to those three for doing that particular work. The next step was to then test them, initially with the initial test, the Y37, assessing 37 markers, and then going up to the big Y test to assess 200,000 markers. And the funding for this either was paid for by the people themselves, but remember a lot of the people we approached had no interest in genealogy. They hadn't done their family tree and they were just getting on with raising the kids and uh, you know, being distracted by life. So, uh, but a lot of them were fascinated by the idea behind the project and agreed to fund the testing themselves, which was really generous of them. Uh, sometimes we were able to raise money in the DNA project and pay for them via the general fund. Uh, the clan association put in some money as well. And we did apply for research grants, but unfortunately so far we have not been successful. The Heritage Council only approves about 50% of the research uh, applications each year, and we were not successful on this occasion. And the last step then is to validate each lineage, but using standards from 2022, not from 1946, not from 1832, from 2022, and develop proof arguments for each generation going back up into the 1400s. So let's look at steps one to three. Identify the extensive lineage, trace the living descendants, and test them. These are the 13 people that we have identified so far who are descended from Grace O'Malley's immediate male forebears. And um, I've kind of color-coded them. Uh, this line one here represents the O'Malley's of Ross House and Ackle, and they are supposedly descended from Malachlan, who is supposedly a brother of Grace O'Malley, according to some, but not all, of these extensive lineages. Line two was the Kilmilken O'Malley's, who go back to Sean the Firina, and then go back to Dermot, who would have been a, a son, who would have been an uncle of, of Grace O'Malley. Line three is the Bally Burke O'Malley's, and they go back to Donal, who would have been a son of of Grace's great-great-grandfather, Dermot. And then we have line four, uh, which goes down to the O'Malley's of Clunan, um, and they appear to have died out completely, and we haven't been able to find any living descendants of that particular branch. And then we have line five, who are the descendants of Donal and Pippa, but they disappear from the record after about three generations. So those were the 13 descendants, all in uh, green down here. And the first results to come back were for the Kilmilken O'Malley's, and three of them had done the big Y test. And lo and behold, the Kilmilken O'Malley's, they all match each other, but they don't match anyone in group 3A. They actually form their own group, group 3G, and they have a common ancestor with group 3A, but that was 1,850 years ago, which is well before the time of surnames. So there was no uh, genealogical connection, if you like, between uh, the Kilmilken O'Malley's and the group 3A O'Malley's. And this suggested that maybe there had been some sort of a DNA switch somewhere along their direct male line, somewhere upstream of Sean Nafirina in 1740. Uh, or perhaps the genealogies were incorrect and the wrong genealogy had been hung onto the genealogy of Grace O'Malley's immediate family. 
And that wouldn't have been unusual because, of course, in those times, for social or political reasons, people would have tried to establish that they were related in some way to royalty. Now, the next results to come back were these two over here, two first cousins in line one, and they matched each other. There was a genetic distance of just one out of 37. Uh, other than that, they were an exact match to, to each other, only one, of, one uh, mutation uh, between the two of them. And um, they belonged to group 3A. They matched the other people in group 3A. And the next one to test was this other chap down here. He was also a member of line one, but his DNA came back and was completely different, completely different. Uh, so there has been some kind of uh, DNA switch on his line as well. Now, the next results to come back were the big Y results for one of these people, and they showed that he had the SNP FTC67000. And the next one to come back was on line three, which was uh, also a match with group 3A, and when the big Y results came back, he also had the SNP marker FTC67000. And what this basically means, because line one and line three share the same SNP marker, it means that line one and line three have a common ancestor who carried that particular SNP. But the question then is, was that common ancestor Dermot, 1400, or was it somebody else? And that is the question that we need to answer. What we find is, though, that line one and line three are definitely related to each other. They definitely have a common ancestor. Now, the next one back was the big Y results for this particular individual here. And he also, yeah, that's making some strange sounds, isn't it? Shall we try? Let's try it. Let's try it off and I'll just project. Can you all hear me okay? Good, okay. Um, so these results down here just confirmed that the two people in line three shared this uh, particular SNP marker. And uh, it just really confirmed and uh, bolstered what we had already discovered. And then the last one uh, to, oh yes, and it also identified a DNA marker that was just shared by these two people here in line three. And that was FTC 68757, um, but it was specific just to these two people. And this is what's gonna happen as more and more people test, is that initially we'll find a common ancestor up here, but then more people will test and the common ancestor will move down here, and more people will test and the common ancestor will move even further downstream towards the present day. And it also tells us that the, the upstream SNP, FTC67000, had to have formed sometime before this common ancestor here, William O'Malley, 1847. So it puts a restriction on these age estimates that makes the statistical analysis much more precise. So these are the advantages of testing as many people as possible. And the last person that we've tested so far is this chap here. He also matches group 3A, and we are now waiting for his big Y results to come through. And if they do come through, um, and we're hoping that we'll have a triangulation point up here at TAIG in 1665. And that will be really exciting, because that will be the furthest triangulation point back so far. So the next steps are to continue testing uh, big Y for all line one descendants, um, but also as we're doing this, identify more descendants and test them. And we're hoping that more living descendants will come out of the woodwork in due course. And always the aim is to triangulate back as far as possible, because this will be very, very helpful when it comes to looking at the age estimates for each of the branching points. And the next steps for the genealogy is, first of all, validate each line. And that means developing a proof argument for each generation. And then also to match the, uh, the age estimates, that's called the time to most recent common ancestor estimates, uh, to the known dates in the genealogies and see if they correspond with each other. 
And in that regard, uh, this is a slide from June in 2022 at the O'Malley Plan Rally, um, just before the O'Malley Plan Rally. And these were the dates for the various parts of the, the, the if you like, the Mayo O'Malley portion of the Tree of Mankind. And you can see that there's a lot of uh, O'Malley's on either side. Uh, some of them are called uh, Melia. Some of them are called Mali. This chap here, Beeler, um, uh, recognized a DNA switch in his family, and he actually has an O'Malley uh, progenitor going back along his direct male line. Um, so this was what it was like in June, and you can see here that the, eldest, the oldest date for the overall group was 1029 AD, and the next one down was 1044 and 1387. But if we go to the next slide, which is the current one, it's changed to 885, 1101, and 1360. So you can see that as more data comes in, these age estimates will be refined. And currently, uh, these, this is line three here on this particular branch, and line one sits on the branch uh, just above that. Um, but as more line one people will test, we'll find more sub-branches downstream of where we currently are. And the date for the, um, for the overarching uh, SNP for line one and line three is set at 1643, not at 1400, at 1643. And that's 243 years later than the time that we think Dermot was born. Dermot born in 1400, the current age estimate is 1643 for the common ancestor between line one and line three. But if you look at the 95% confidence interval, 1400 does fall within that interval. So it's still possible. It hasn't been ruled out at this point in time, but it is a little unusual. But these things happen. That's why they're called 95% confidence intervals. So those are line one and line three, and that's where we're up to currently in the project. And does this DNA signature, DNA uh, marker here, is that the one that Dermot had that pa he passed down to his line one descendants and his line three descendants? That's what we hope further data will help us uh, uh, either confirm or refute. And while all that is going on, we have started developing a proof argument for each ancestor, generation by generation. And the question is, X is the son of Y because evidence A, evidence B, evidence C. And preferably we need three pieces of evidence. And it's going to be relatively easy to do this back to about 1800 because the records are pretty good for the 1800s, for the 1900s. For the 1700s and the 1600s, they get very iffy. And for the 1500s and the 1400s, it's going to be pretty difficult. And we're going to be relying on secondary sources probably for that particular period from the likes of previous genealogists like Sir Owen O'Malley, Sir Samuel O'Malley, and so on. Um, we're going to try and use a traffic light system to give an idea of how strong the evidence is for each step along the way. And it may very well be that um, some lines cannot be fully validated. And in that sort of situation, we may have to do some fairly clever logical acrobatics to try and come up with some kind of argument. But what it's going to look like is, and we're only, we're only have to look at those lines that match each other, the group 3A lines, we can gray out the other ones. It's probably going to look something like this. The 1800s and the 1900s will get a green, the 1700s and 1600s will get an amber, and then the 1500s and 1400s will probably get a red. And if that occurs, then we may have to do something clever like Bayesian probability statistics, which is what they did when they found the remains of Richard III um, in the car park in the social work department of Leicester uh, Social Services. Um, what they were able to do is use the DNA, but also use other pieces of documentary evidence to come to a conclusion that it was 99 point 9997% probable that the remains they found were those of Richard III. And with a bit of luck, we may be able to do something similar to get into at least the 90% probability that we have found the DNA signature of Grace O'Malley's great-great-grandfather, Dermot. That's the hope. That's the aspiration. Whether we get there or not is another thing. 
And I want to talk briefly about the case of Malachlan because I know uh, Anne is going to mention some aspects of this as well. Was he the brother of Grace O'Malley? Because if he wasn't, and he is the progenitor of line one, does that screw up everything? And are we, you know, is the whole project then scuppered? Well, there's little evidence that he was, and there's little evidence that he wasn't, as far as I can see. He did succeed Grace's father owned of Dara as the clan chief in 1576, and there was a Malachlan who signed the composition of Connacht in 1585. I'm assuming it was the same man, but there's also other reports that he died in 1580, um, leaving an infant son behind him. Uh, he is not mentioned by Grace to Queen Elizabeth I when he goes to meet her uh, as her brother. She mentions Donald of Pippa, but she doesn't mention Malachlan. And she doesn't mention Tighe, who is another supposed brother of Grace O'Malley. Um, but Grace didn't always tell the whole truth when she was talking to Queen Elizabeth. So the question is, did she leave them out for political reasons? We don't know. Um, but even if he wasn't a brother of Grace, because he succeeded her father, he would have had to have been a member of the Derb Finna. Now, the Derb Finna was the immediate male relatives of the individual going out, out to about the second cousin level. And Owen, uh, Owen of Dara's second cousins would also have descended from Dermot 1400. So even if Malachlan wasn't a, a brother of Grace O'Malley, it doesn't, it doesn't derail us from what we're trying to achieve because he still would have been a descendant of Dermot, born about 1400. Uh, and there's, there's the um, immediate male forebears of, of Grace going back to Dermot, born 1400. So that's where we currently are. And you can see that, you know, we, we're, we haven't been derailed yet, but I'm always waiting for that spanner to be thrown into the works. And um, we'll just have to wait and see where this project takes us. But that's where we are at the moment. Uh, where are we going to find the primary sources? Well, a lot of them might have been collected by previous O'Malley scholars, such as Sir Owen O'Malley, uh, Sir Samuel O'Malley, Austin O'Malley, H.T. Knox, Professor Connor Charles O'Malley and Kelly, J.D. O'Malley, Sheila Malloy and Chambers, Cormac O'Malley, Micah O'Malley from Ross House, Anna Dunlop, and Harold O'Malley from Ross House as well. So there's a lot of information there. I think the Ross House archives have been donated to, the univers to University College Galway. Uh, so it may mean a, a visit there. I have gone to the National Library uh, of Ireland in Dublin and the Genealogical Office and I have taken 2,000 photographs of all the O'Malley relevant documents that are there. That's a very a summary of them all. Um, and what we can say in terms of the story so far, there are two separate origins of the O'Malley surname. There are 17 distinct genetic groups, but the two biggest ones are group 3A, which we think are the Mayo O'Malley's, and group 2, the Limerick O'Malley's. We have identified 13 living descendants, or supposed, they are living, but they're supposed descendants, 13 living supposed descendants of Grace's great-great-grandfather. Uh, you can see five on line one, six on line two, two on line three, and line four and line five. As far as we know, they've died out, but you never know when one will certainly appear in the right place in the genetic family tree. Um, we know that line one and line three do share a common ancestor. The question is, was it Dermot, born about 1400? We are proceeding with the validation of the pedigrees, and we are awaiting further big Y tests, which will hopefully refine these age estimates, and that could be a very interesting development in the project. So those are the next steps. Continue to look for funding, continue to look for other descendants, triangulate it back as far as possible in the family tree. We'll continue the validation process, get these more accurate age estimates, and the next update I'm giving will be in November in Sydney at a conference called Family History Down Under, where, I'll be, where we'll have the next update, which also will go up on YouTube, just like all of the talks today. And we're aiming ultimately for a scientific publication and we're aiming for a book. So all that remains for me to say is a big thank you to the O'Malley Clan Association, big thank you to Brendan, Emer, and Tom for doing all the outreach work and the genealogy work associated with the project. 
a big thank you to all of the previous O'Malley scholars on whose shoulders we stand today. And um, if anyone is interested, we there is we're like a political party in the DNA in the O'Malley DNA project. No donation too big will ever be refused. So, um, uh, lastly, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.